This episode is brought to you in part by Pittsburgh Seminary's Henderson Leadership Conference, September 22nd to 24th with Dr. Diana Butler-Bass. Attend in person or online for lectures and workshops with strategies for ministry amid political and theological divisions. Visit www.pts.edu slash Henderson. This episode is brought to you by Our Daily Bread Ministries, a global media organization that makes the life-changing wisdom of the Bible understandable and accessible to all. Visit whereyou'refrom.org for more information. That's where, Y-A, from, dot O-R-G. We're talking about communism and atheism. Please keep in mind that not all atheists advocate the violence and oppression that was used under the Soviet Union. And forgive me, I have a cold, so my voice may sound a little strange. I'm pleased to be here today with you who are keeping America great by keeping her good. Only through your work and prayers, and those of millions of others, can we hope to survive this perilous century. This is the voice of President Ronald Reagan, addressing the National Association of Evangelicals. It was March 8th, 1983. This is known as his Evil Empire speech. It's one of his most famous, along with Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. If you've ever heard any speeches by Ronald Reagan, it's probably these two. Both addressed communism. This one covers a lot of ground. Nuclear proliferation, abortion, school prayer, and rising secularism. Now, I don't have to tell you that this puts us in opposition to, or at least out of step with, a, a prevailing attitude of many who have turned to a modern day secularism. I'm serious when I say you should listen to the whole speech. I'll post it on social media. A whole college course could be taught just on this one message. It pretty well encapsulates a certain strain of evangelicalism in the early 1980s. And there are some hidden surprises that get lost in all the other big issues. Yes, there's the usual presidential rah-rah moments, but he also takes time to acknowledge the dark legacy of the United States, too. Our nation, too, has a legacy of evil with which it must deal. The glory of this land has been its capacity for transcending the moral evils of our past. For example, the long struggle of minority citizens for equal rights. And this little bit about racism that feels like it still needs to be said today. There is no room for racism, anti-Semitism, or other forms of ethnic and racial hatred in this country. He even asked preachers to speak out against bigotry. I know that you've been horrified, as have I, by the resurgence of some hate groups preaching bigotry and prejudice. Use the mighty voice of your pulpits and the powerful standing of your churches to denounce and isolate these hate groups in our midst. It feels like he's talking to us today, right? This speech is known not just for the pro-life stance in the defense of the nuclear arsenal, but also for other reasons. First of all, where it was delivered, to a convention of evangelicals. Maybe that's not so strange. Almost all U.S. presidents have been churchgoers. The history books are full of speeches quoting scripture. But Reagan stands out when talking about presidents and faith because he so frequently tied Christianity to U.S. politics. Not always to everyone's delight. Some commentators from the time criticized his use of moral and religious language as propaganda to achieve his political goals. But he wasn't the only one to do so. The same was true in the Soviet Union. Famously atheistic, the Soviets used anti-religious propaganda to further their agenda, to encourage people to work harder and grow in their patriotism. The US and communists duked it out using similar tools in very different ways. You're listening to the show that uses journalistic tools to look inside the Christian church. We press pause on the culture wars in order to explore how we got here and how we can do better. I'm Chris Starin, and this is Truce. This episode is brought to you by No Small Endeavor, the acclaimed podcast from Great Feeling Studios and PRX. 
In each episode, host and award-winning theologian Lee C. Camp sits down with courageous and impassioned people, like Hollywood legend Rob Reiner and civil rights hero Reverend James Lawson, talking about what it means to find true happiness and flourish in day-to-day life. And if you're looking for somewhere to start, why not check out the recent episode with award-winning journalist and best-selling author Tim Alberta on Christian nationalism's role in the Republican Party. Follow No Small Endeavor on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. I've got some help in telling this story today. This season is full of great books written by interesting people. Let's add another one to that pile. I'm Roland Elliott Brown, and the book is called Godless Utopia, Soviet Anti-Religious Propaganda. Published by Fuel. It would be an interesting coffee table book. It's full of pictures that are just fascinating, though they may be a bit much for young kids. His interest in the Soviets and the Cold War started early. Uh, I'm a 1980s kid. I grew up in North America. And uh, when I was a little kid, too young to be in any way politically conscious, the idea that the Cold War was a religious struggle was something that people were still talking about. Uh, So, for example, if you think of Ronald Reagan's Evil Empire speech... Which we heard a bit of just a moment ago. Do you want me to play a clip? No, you guys probably remember it. Uh, Or another famous speech that Alexandra Solzhenitsyn gave in London, uh, which is sometimes called the Men Have Forgotten God speech. Alexandra Solzhenitsyn wrote a Nobel Prize winning book on the Soviet prison camps, or gulags, called the Gulag Archipelago. These guys and others, when talking about the Soviet Union, did so in a particular way. Some of communism's religious critics put atheism at the center of Soviet totalitarianism. To put communism's atheism in the spotlight is kind of a no-brainer. When the Bolsheviks, the majority party in Russia after the fall of the Romanovs, came into power, they targeted religion, especially Christianity, which was due in no small part to the writings of Karl Marx, one of the founding fathers of communist thought. He wrote that famous phrase, religion is the opium of the masses. But do you know the context of that phrase? Here it is, edited for you just a little bit. But he says, religious distress is at the same time the expression of real distress and the protest against real distress. Religion is the sigh of the oppressed creature, the heart of a heartless world, just as it is the spirit of a spiritless situation. It is the opium of the people. The abolition of religion as the illusory happiness of the people is required for their real happiness. The demand to give up the illusions about its condition is the demand to give up a condition which needs illusions. So that's all very complex. He's basically saying that life is hard. People are oppressed. So they use religion like you might use an opiate to numb the pain. He argued that if you took away people's oppression, they would no longer need religion. In his book Capital, published in 1867, he said that man's religious reflex would only vanish when mankind got along and when he was good with nature. The Soviets were in the business of economic equality. Marx was their man. He laid out their blueprint of how to build a more egalitarian society. The Soviets took the ideas of Marx and used them to get what they wanted. Yes, they wanted economic equality, food on every table, work for every worker. But they tried to achieve it by murdering anyone who disagreed with them. Or who just thought about disagreeing. Or was in the wrong place at the wrong time. He wrote on religion from different angles uh, at, d- at different times in his career, and uh, you know, it wasn't his main subject. His main subject was obviously political economy. Um, but the Bolsheviks certainly seized on this idea of abolition uh, after they'd seized power uh, in the October Revolution, and that was in part because they tipped the country into a civil war, and religion tended to be on the other side of that civil war. Religion was a target for so many reasons. Marx didn't like it, for one. Also, the Orthodox Church was a symbol of the old regime. Being that it was a department under the Tsars, the Orthodox Church was part of the opposition to the Bolsheviks in the Civil War. And in particular from Patriarch Tikhon, uh, who, although he didn't 
take sides in the Civil War, uh, anathematized the Bolsheviks. The state-run church was therefore a clear enemy to the incoming communist regime. Once they came to power, the communist government went to work combating the church in public opinion. What makes Roland's book so unique is that it focuses on the artwork, the posters and magazines from this era, anti-religious propaganda. The book is filled with colorful and sometimes scary images that were disseminated in the Soviet Union. Uh, it's worth noting that uh, most of the Russian population at the time was, uh, was illiterate. Uh, and so the, the early Soviet graphics uh, were a way of showing the population uh, who was the enemy of the new state. Some of the most striking designs also take shots at the United States, playing off our own cruelty at the time, including the introduction of the electric chair. This was a really strange case, the case of uh, Ruth Snyder. She was uh, an American woman who was uh, convicted of murder. Murder, murder. Ruth Snyder. In 1927, she and her lover killed her husband and covered up the evidence, making it look like a burglary gone wrong. Then she tried to collect on his life insurance. She didn't get away with it. Ruth Snyder was the first woman ever sent to the electric chair. It was big news. Newspaper reporters wanted a picture of the execution, but photography wasn't allowed in the execution chamber. So one reporter rigged a small camera capable of just one shot to his ankle and had actually photographed uh, her while she was being executed in the electric chair, and the photograph had made its way into the New York Daily News. The photograph is blurry, but distinct, enough to make your stomach turn. This picture made its way to Soviet artists and was reproduced in a work of artistic propaganda, complete with the same unsettling blur. Then they tied it rather arbitrarily to Christianity, calling it something like, uh, sarcastically, an achievement of Christian culture. As in, America thinks it's a Christian nation, and those Christians sent a woman to the electric chair. They were using controversial issues in our country, debates we were having, and turning them against us. They made a lot of hay out of the national sins of the United States. So, for example, we've got we've got a couple of images to do with uh, to do with lynching, and in both in both cases, they're described as um, products of of Christian America. This was, of course, around the time of the revival of the Ku Klux Klan, sparked in no small part by the release of D. W. Griffith's film *The Birth of a Nation*, a deeply offensive silent film that lampooned African American politicians in the years after the Civil War. With the resurgence of the Klan came burning crosses. Jim Crow laws, and, of course, the lynching of African Americans. This national shame did not escape the eyes of the Soviets. So, for example, we've got we've got a couple of images to do with uh, to do with lynching, and in both in both cases, they're described as um, products of of Christian America. I asked Roland to describe one of these images. It's got a white background and there are angels unfur unfurling an American flag in the background. And there's um, a Statue of Liberty uh, holding a torch in one hand and the almighty dollar in another. There's uh, a religious figure which uh, is possibly meant to be Jesus holding a text which says, yeah, it must be Jesus, uh, holding a text which says, come unto me all ye that labor and I will give you rest being death, and there's a there's a capitalist looking on as well. Yeah, I mean it's a it's a horrific and and rather uh, rather cheap image in a way. Uh, again, it's rather arbitrarily tied to tied to Christianity. The idea of, of of lynching of Black Americans was something that came up again and again in in Soviet Soviet messaging about the United States. You know, it became almost like a it became almost a cliche. Um, a cliched retort or a cliched way of changing the subject whenever uh, the Soviet Union was criticized over political repression. Uh, there was a sense they wouldn't take uh, criticism from Americans because in America, 
Uh, they lynch black people. It was a way of distracting from the horrors of the Soviet Union. Sure, they were murdering millions of their own people, but so-called Christian Americans killed with the electric chair and lynching. We should be pretty used to this language in our current political state. Don't worry about what we're doing. Look at what they're doing. Those people, our enemies, are so much worse than we are. Meanwhile, to use Roland's words, the Soviet Union was a human rights inferno. There are other themes in the propaganda. One is the theme of young people speaking quote-unquote truth to their elders. Roland described one of the most startling images in the book. Well, this image describes what looks like a, a peasant hut in the village, and it's, um, it's, it's quite dark and it's full of earth tones. There are wooden walls, wooden furniture. There are people in this cabin, peasants, what seems to be a mother and father standing in the middle of the room. Their children are there too. One of whom is wearing the scarf of the, the young pioneers, that is the young communist youth league. A small boy paints a big banner on the floor. Uh, which shows uh, workers marching past a church with its onion, onion domes, uh, carrying a banner that says religion is the opium of the people. It's the kids who are doing the work, championing the cause. This theme of generational conflict was a popular one in Soviet propaganda. The younger generation shirking off the bonds of the old ways. There is another poster in the book. In the background is a school on one side and a dark, creepy church on the other. A young, blonde-haired girl reaches toward the school, towards education, towards the sunny side of the street. But an old, ugly, haggard woman pulls her by her ponytail towards the church. The message is obvious. Young people want to learn are hungry for the ways of socialism. It's the old, the superstitious, who hold them back. Stalin, the second man to rule communist Russia, was intimately acquainted with the Orthodox faith, even turning some of its religious symbols into symbols of the regime, not just for posters and magazines, but also monuments. The first thing to understand is that Stalin studied in a, in a seminary. He trained to be a priest, and he was brought up with the all of the background and, and symbolism of that austere and authoritarian uh, Russian Orthodox Church. Students were punished, uh, sent to punishment cells for reading European novels, like uh, Victor Hugo uh, was, was pretty popular in the seminary, I think. And, uh, students could basically be imprisoned for reading these novels, which were banned. Which surprised me at first because Les Mis is one of the most popular works associated with Christianity. But it also takes place in an era of revolution, something I'm guessing the Tsars didn't want people thinking about. So he, his educational experience was, was that of a mini tyranny, and he, so to speak, converted to Marxism during his seminary days. Historians like to refer to Stalin's religious heritage, especially in connection to Lenin's funeral, for a number of reasons. Stalin understood the power of symbols, icons, and remembrance, all of which are vital to the Orthodox religion. In order to achieve his atheistic goals for the country, he would have to do away with the symbols of religion. One method the communists used was to demonstrate to people that their relics were not all that powerful. You may not be familiar with relics, but they play an important role in Christian history. They could be things like supposed pieces of Jesus' cross, or the slab that he was laid on in the tomb. Items that appear in Bible stories or may have been in them are seen as really valuable to some Christians. And relics didn't stop coming once the Bible was completed. Items held or worn by saints became imbued with meaning to many. The very bodies of saints hold importance as well. This is true for Catholics, as well as Orthodox worshippers. Uh, preserving the bodies of, of Russian saints, as what were called relics, uh, bodies shut up in coffins which were said never to uh, decay or to be incorruptible was the, the word that they used. They promoted this idea that if someone was really holy, their body would never decay. The problem with that theory is that it's kind of easy to debunk. 
You just have to open the casket. One of the early Bolshevik anti-religious campaigns, which, re- which is referred to in some of the art in this book, was to go around the churches and smash open these icon- these, um, these relics and, uh, and show the people that, in fact, these saints had either decayed and they were skeletons or that they were, they were mummies or, or dummies. Uh, maybe not even real people. There was a certain amount of flim-flam in the church's practice. In order to get people to believe that the saints' bodies did not rot, they did some prop work. Yes, we can be angry at the Soviets for desecrating graves, but also keep in mind that they were uncovering a lie that the church had been perpetuating. The church shouldn't have done this in the first place. But unlike the bodies in those caskets, Stalin was no dummy. He learned in seminary just how important symbols are to people. Icons, bodies of saints. So when it came to Lenin's funeral, something Stalin was really involved in, he co-opted the idea of a saint's body being perfectly preserved. Uh, Lenin's... Uh, Lenin's famous embalming and and the display of his body, which you can still see in Red Square in Moscow, seems to be either a conscious or unconscious reference to this orthodox habit of of preserving the bodies of of saints. It wasn't just about slamming religion. It was also about co-opting the symbols of Christianity to promote communism. Stalin himself was later buried in that, that mausoleum for a time, or or rather not buried, put on display, preserved and put on display. It's a little gross, isn't it? But it's true. Search the internet and you can see Lenin laying there, looking very much like a mannequin. This, by the way, is something that has been done to many Catholic popes. You can see them on display at St. Peter's Basilica in the Vatican. Take it from me, it's plain creepy to be there. Especially if, like me, you stumble into that section and probably aren't supposed to be there. This cult of personality that grew up under Lenin and then Stalin was something that Nikita Khrushchev, two leaders after Stalin, did away with. He was not a fan of the cult of personality built up around Lenin and Stalin. Also, he noticed that Stalin had eased up on Christians during World War II. Stalin had used what remained of the Orthodox Church to encourage Russian Christians to fight for Russia against the Nazis. When I say eased up, though, let's be clear. Stalin had already killed millions. Khrushchev did away with that easing, reinstating persecutions. As far as visual propaganda went, under Khrushchev, it took a bit of a turn, focusing on technology and the space race. They launched the first satellite into orbit, Sputnik, and then the first man into orbit, and those must have been a huge badge of honor for the Soviet Union. Their anti-religious art reflected that. One theme in the space propaganda is, is this idea that the cosmonaut goes into space and he doesn't see God or angels in space. Uh, this is actually a reference to something that came up much earlier in the Soviet period because the Soviet pilots, like uh, Chikalov, for example, would say the same thing. They would, they would take their plane ab- above the clouds and they would say there are no angels or, or, or gods in the clouds. Uh, and this was part of atheist propaganda. And it it goes back to what I said earlier about you know much of the country having been in in a kind of um, medieval state of mind. I mean, this reflects a, a medieval conception of the of the sky, the firmament. Because medieval imagery showed God up in the clouds. That's where heaven was. We've got a track record in the church of trying to fill in gaps where the Bible is silent, like saying that the Earth is the center of the universe because it's the focus of the Bible or that the bodies of saints don't rot. The trouble comes when our attempts at guessing the answers to life's big questions become doctrine. And then that doctrine is easily debunked. For example, when people could travel above the clouds and see that God wasn't up there. It's not that the Bible was wrong. It's that those guesses, those attempts to fill in the gaps where the Bible is silent, became official even though there was no proof. It's the guesses that were wrong. Soviet artists took advantage of these superstitions in poster after poster. The Soviets created a mountain of artwork, literature, bulletins, and more to counter their detractors, to make the people think like they wanted them to think. 
In the later years of the Soviet Union, this flood of propaganda spurred a kind of backlash. With religion so effectively targeted, counter-revolutionaries and those who just wanted to look edgy donned the clothing of religious people. Uh, it, was, it was kind of punk in a way. Uh, because it, it wasn't it wasn't what the it wasn't what the state wanted. So uh, if you were young and rebellious, uh, maybe you'd risk it. Sporting crosses, carrying Bibles, while wearing jeans, which were a coveted, rather American item of clothing. As I said in an earlier episode, throughout time, Christianity has been seen both as the aggressor and as the savior. Since the Soviet state hated religion so much. The rebels clung to Christian imagery as part of their cause. Because of their propaganda and the mass destruction of religious people, it was easy for Westerners to tie atheism to communism. Godless communism wasn't a stretch. There were two different Soviet propaganda magazines called Godless. Over the months I've worked on this series, I've had the opportunity to have many conversations with different kinds of people. Experts, authors, and people I've just met at parties who kind of like communism and socialism. Some have acknowledged the association with atheism, and some have given me the impression that it's kind of basic to dovetail the two. But you see it, right? Communism and socialism are clearly associated. Let's carry that into the United States in this era. Even as late as the 1980s when Stalin and Khrushchev were both dead, this dovetailing of communism and atheism was reinforced in our own messaging. Here again is Ronald Reagan from the Evil Empire speech. Yes, let us pray for the salvation of all of those who live in that totalitarian darkness. Pray they will discover the joy of knowing God. But until they do, let us be aware that while they preach the supremacy of the state, declare its omnipotence over individual man and predict its eventual domination of all peoples on the earth. They are the focus of evil in the modern world. Our response to communism as Americans was to be prayer. And if I'd played the clip a little longer, he would also have advocated for building up the nuclear arsenal. Because Christians had so boldly declared that the United States was a Christian nation, we'll get into that debate soon, the actions of the United States were used to clobber Christianity. Because the Soviets so boldly declared that the USSR was an atheistic nation, the US could use their actions to talk trash about atheists. When we align ourselves with a nation, we become entangled in the actions of that nation. Are we okay with that association? It's a loaded question, right? Just think about the examples from this episode. We've demonstrated that people drew lines connecting Christianity and the electric chair to the lynching of African Americans, building up the nuclear arsenal and the potential for the United States to end humanity as we know it. All of those things were tied to Christianity. Propaganda, even if it's clearly biased like that of the Soviet Union, sometimes points out a little bit of truth. We, the Christian church, are entangled. We always have been. The question is, are we sure we want it that way? Does the gospel make it through all that noise? What is our true mission? And once we've gone down that road, is there any way to go back? Special thanks to Roland Elliott Brown for his help with this story. His book, again, is Godless Utopia. I put links to it on our website at trucepodcast.com. It's worth at least checking out the book's website because you can see many of these fascinating pictures for yourself. I've been challenging you, my listeners, to help out each episode this season. So this week, I'd really appreciate your prayers. This show takes a lot of effort time, money, and sleepless hours lying awake trying to figure out how to present these topics. Join me in prayer for this show, for my sanity, and for those who will stumble on these discussions. Follow us on social media at Truce Podcast. You can also leave reviews for the show on Apple Podcasts to help people find us. Here's one review from a listener named Troy. Completely underrated gem. 
There is no other Christian podcast doing anything like this. I cannot recommend it high enough. This is fantastic radio journalism and storytelling on a level that I love. Thanks, Troy. Leave us a review on your podcasting app, and I may just read it on the show. God willing, we'll be back in two Tuesdays with a new episode. I'm Chris Starin with a serious head cold, and this is Truce.